The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your spirit. spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. After hearing his doctrine, many of the followers of Jesus said, this is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? And Jesus was aware that his followers were complaining about it and said, does this upset you? What if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and their life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the outset those who did not believe. And who it was that would betray him. And he went on, this is why I told you that no one could come to me unless the Father allows him. After this, many of his disciples left him and stopped going with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, What about you? Do you want to go away too? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the message of eternal life. And we believe, we know, that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So our reading today is a culmination of the Bread of Life discourse. Remember where we started? We started with the feeding of the 5,000. Then the walking on the water at night where Peter actually got to take a little, a little walk on the, on the water with them. Then they land up on the shores of Capernaum, and, and, and there, when they come looking for him, Jesus says, you didn't come looking for me because you saw the sign. You came looking because you had your fill. Your belly was full, so you came. In other words, in John's Gospel, the sign is, is the revelation of the true identity of who Jesus is. So they didn't come because the identity of Jesus was revealed and they came to believe. They came because they had what they wanted. This food that was provided for them. The Bread of Life discourse went into, into many, many different turns and twists. But in the very beginning, Jesus was saying, you have to see the sign. That when the, the bread and, and, and the fish were multiplied, you have to see the sign. When the wine at Cana, when the water in, in Cana was turned into wine, you have to see the sign. The sign is what connects the activity that you see with your naked eyes to the truth that lies behind that activity. And until you can see through the activity of the bread that fed 5,000, the five loaves and the two fish that fed the 5,000, until you can see behind that, that that speaks to who I am as God, then all you will do is come to me because you want to have your belly full. Jesus moves them along and, and moves them to, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you cannot have life in me. And, and this was an, an insistent statement. One where, one where he, he, he doesn't relent. He then changes the verb to eat from fago, which could be metaphorical, to trogo which is literally tearing flesh. And, and, and he leaves no, no room for wiggle here because when he changes the verb to eat, to struggle, it, it is clear in any first century Jew's mind that, that this, this, no, no, he's not speaking about a metaphor about believing in him as son of God or believing in his teaching and in his words, which was the second stage of the of the the discourse of, of John 6. He's not talking about those two. He's talking about literally tearing flesh here. 
And, and any first century Jew would have heard that. And, and rightly, they would have been alarmed. As, as we also saw, drinking of the blood was prohibited by Leviticus because the ancient religions believed that the, that the animals were the bodies of the gods. And, and they used to kill the animals to drink the blood of the animals to have communion or, or to have that, that intimacy with the gods. And they were forbidden from, from drinking the blood drinking blood at all so that when he says you must drink my blood he's going directly against Le De Leviticus and, and this is the backdrop now for our reading and, and the, the, the last thing he says this, this doctrine was given in Capernaum so, so in the synagogue in Capernaum so we know that this is, this is not just a, a whimsical thing that this was actually a homily that he gives and this homily John calls it a doctrine a, a doctrine is something that we have to believe so we come now to our reading and 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 I want to tell you it's a tough one and and I wish I had some easy way to make it go down you know they they, they put sugar coating on a, on a tablet when they want you to, to, to eat it so that it tastes nice so you, you'll, you'll want to eat it but, but there's, no, there's no sugar coating on this tablet. And, and so we have, to, we have to give ourselves over to what he's saying here. So it starts by saying, after hearing his doctrine, many of the followers of Jesus said, this is intolerable language. What they're speaking about is having to trog you, to eat, to tear flesh, and having to drink blood. That this is intolerable language. And, and, and what happens then? How can anyone accept it? Now, this is a turning point for Jesus. Huh? Now, in a, in a modern world, what we would do at that point is we, we would do a survey and see who believes and who don't believe, and we spin the doctrine towards where, wherever the crowd would, 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 would accept the most of what we want to see. That's so. That's what we would do. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus leaves his doctrine exactly as it is and kind of pushes it in their face a little bit more. And, 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 and this is important because it is at this very moment that Jesus should be saying, oh gosh, oh God, what is wrong with you all? You all can't understand. I'm only talking metaphorically. Remember in, the, in, the, in his doctrine, he says, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven, invoking the name that God revealed himself to Moses. And by saying the I am, he's again insisting on his identity as true God. And he does not back away and say, y'all are talking metaphorically. What is wrong with you? Calm yourself down. Do, do carry on. Is a, is a metaphor making a little literal. He doesn't do that at all. He takes the ante and he, he ups it a lot. And, and, and let's follow him through, through his discourse. So he says that he was, Jesus was aware that they were complaining about him. Now he's talking about bread and he says they're complaining. We had to go right back to Moses and the manna in the desert, huh? Because remember, they were complaining about the manna. They were complaining. This is unsatisfying food. How could you ask us to keep eating this day in and day night? This is unsatisfying. So the, the gospel here is, is, is evoking the memory of the, of the Israelites who were complaining. And, and by evoking that memory, we have those who were complaining to Moses and now the listeners complaining to Jesus. And he says, well, you know, does this upset you? Does this upset you? And we would expect a soften now. But he takes it up. What if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Now, this is the weirdest way to answer the question. What if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? This is a reference back to the beginning of John's Gospel when Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree. 
And Andrew came to call him and he said, Nazareth, anything good could come from there. When Nathaniel actually met Jesus, Jesus says, there's a man incapable of deceit. And he said, how do you know me? He said, ah, before Andrew called you, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Boom. Man get out just so. And, and immediately Nathaniel understands that he has to be son of God. And Nathaniel's whole mind opens up. And Jesus continues to say, I tell you solemnly, you see greater things than this. You will see heaven laid open and the angels of God ascending and descending. So he's referring back to that, that conversation he had with Nathaniel. What if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Which says two things. One, that the Son of Man, his origins is not here on earth. Where he was before, his origins are actually in the heavens with God. And, and ascend to where he was before, ascend to God. What if you see the Son of Man as he was before the incarnation? What, what if you were to see the full mystery of who I am? Not, 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 not just as man, but as God. What if you were to see that full mystery laid before you? And by talking about ascending, <clears throat> he's talking in the future now. After the death, death and resurrection, when he will ascend to where he was before. And so they, they, he's invoking now. Not, not just that where he was before, speaking about before the incarnation, now he's speaking about after the, the life, death, and resurrection, when, when he will ascend into heaven and sit in glory with his father. <clears throat> and by evoking the ascension, he's now, he's now speaking in a whole different plane and a whole different way. And he's trying to help us to understand that. And he says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Wow. He's evoking now Nicodemus in John 3. Unless a man is born again from above, cannot see the kingdom of God. How could a grown man go back into his mother's womb and be born again, Nicodemus would ask him. And Jesus insisted, insists that a man must be born again. A man must be born again. And then he says the spirit goes where it wills. And he talks about the, the role of the spirit there. And, and, and what, he's, what he's doing here in the text, first by, by pushing us to think or to contemplate the ascension when he will ascend into heaven. And also is teaching to Nicodemus on baptism, that it is through baptism that we are born again and, and, and become, become children of God. He, he's moving the discourse now from anything on the human plane, he's moving it now to the mystical plane. <clears throat> and talking about, about the fact that the reason why you cannot see is because you have not been born again from, from, from above. And, and when, when the ascension happens and he's taken up into heaven and we understand that, then the mystery of the Eucharist and the bread of life will become much easier for us to understand. Never completely easy, but a lot easier for us to understand. Or at least that is the cue or the key to use to unlock the sacred mystery. The next piece of the text is... is is a simple piece, but there are some of you who do not believe, and Jesus knew from the outset who was going to betray him. You know, most of his disciples walked away and left him, huh? and it says that. Most of them, after this, many of his disciples left him and stopped going with him. Now, it would have been a good thing for Judas to take stage left and exit at this moment. But, but he knew who did not believe, and he was pointing here to Jesus. And who it was that would betray him, he's pointing here, sorry, he's pointing here to Judas. And, and, and in, in here he's hinting that part of the problem that Judas was having was Judas did not believe that he was God. He did not believe that he was the bread of life, and he did not believe 
the words and the teaching of Jesus and he did not believe that unless he eats the bread and drinks the blood that he will not have life in him. And that is why Judas could eat the bread, eat his body and drink his blood and go and betray him right after that because Judas did not believe. There's a real problem with those who do not believe and stay. They sometimes cause more havoc than other people. But as we go through our text, then Jesus said to the 12, what about you? Do you want to go away too? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the message of eternal life. We believe, we know that you are the Holy One of God. Wow. 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 Let's hear Peter again. Huh? Let's hear Peter again. Peter, what about you? Do you want to go away too? And Peter says, Lord, what you're talking is real foolishness. You know? I do understand it. I do know how to make sense of it. I, I, I can't put together the string of words in a sentence that makes sense in my head or my heart. But hear what? I believe in you. And I believe that you are the Holy One of God. And, and, and that's it. To understand or to believe that the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We have, like Peter, at least to start by believing that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is God. We have to start by believing that. If we can't believe that Jesus is God, then there's no way that we could believe that anything happens to the bread and the wine. And, and that's what Peter is saying. He said, Lord, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One of God. And, and it is because Peter believes that he's the Holy One of God that he does not leave because to whom will we go? There's no one else that has the words of life that you have. I don't understand. It makes no sense. It, 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 it is probably vexatious in my spirit. But, but Lord, you, I believe you. So I trust what you say. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, the church teaches doctrines that are, are very difficult for us to understand. And where we start is we have to start where Peter starts. I don't get it, you know, and I don't understand it. But you know something? I believe that God died for the sake of this church. And I believe he promised that the keys of Peter will not, will not be in vain. And, and that what they open, they open. And what they close, they close. And that, that God is with this church. And, 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 and we have to believe that, that Jesus is God. And that he has done what he has done. And, and then we could start to put our mind and our heart to try and understand now what it is we're facing. And that's what Peter is doing here. But, but what it is we're speaking about. I want to go back to the ascension. You see, in the, there's a big word, huh? Transubstantiation. I'm going to say it again for you. Transubstantiation. It's a very big word. And, and so, transubstantiation means that, that the substance of the bread and the substance of the wine become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That the substance is transformed in, into, into the body of Christ and the substance of the wine is transformed into the blood of Christ. That, that's the belief of the church. The accident, which is how it looks, how it smells, how it tastes, the accident remains the same. The substance is what is transformed. Transubstantiation. There are some theologians that believe that what we have in the resurrection is a transubstantiation of the body of Jesus. Because his earthly body, battered, bruised, tattered, with all the holes and all the signs of the sacrifice and the pain and the, the, the excruciation, pain that he's lived through, the, this broken body of Jesus miraculously becomes a body that they could not recognize. 
And, and so the, the, the earthly body somehow is transformed and, and it has new qualities that it did not have before. It walks through walls, we know that. But yet it can eat. And, and you can touch it because Thomas put his hand in, 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 his, in the hole in his hand. And, and, and so the, this, this earthly body of Jesus that he had up until his death becomes a new body in his resurrection and a glorious body and a body that is different, a body that actually goes up into heaven. And, and this new body in the, uh, in the resurrection that Jesus receives is, is, is a transformed body. And, and, and it contains the whole of the Godhead, the way that his earthly body did. But this new ascended body with the new properties it has, that's the body that we eat from. And that's the body that we drink from. What we're eating and drinking in the Eucharist is not of the earthly body of Jesus Christ that, 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 we, that, we, that we've seen crucified. It, it is this transformed body that, that somehow is connected because it still has the holes in his hand. But somehow the disciples just cannot recognize him unless something happens. So, so just as in the walk of Emmaus, when he un, un, unfolded the scriptures to them, and, 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 and then in the breaking of, his, of the bread, their eyes are open, that the, they, they could not see him, although they were very knowledgeable of him and intimate with him, they still could not see him. And it's the same way that in the, in the Eucharist, brothers and sisters, we, we might be intimate with him, but, but it is only through the eyes of faith that we get to see him and to know that this really and truly is the Son of God. Just as Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? And that's our first reading from the book of Joshua. Joshua is saying, you know, the Lord delivered you from, from Pharaoh and, and brought you across the desert, across the sea and through the desert. But when they were, when they were in Egypt, the, the big battle was that the people should be let free to go and worship the, the Lord, to go and serve the Lord. And, and Pharaoh refused to, to free them to serve the Lord. Pharaoh wanted them to serve him. But, but, but Moses... And, and through God's instrument, let the people go so that they could serve the Lord. They reached into the new promised land and, and Joshua says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. There's only one God I will serve. And Peter is saying, as for me and for us, the 12, we will serve the Lord because you have the, the words of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, the mystery of the Eucharist is, is, is a central mystery because in it we have contained the whole of the, of the Trinity. We have the whole doctrine of the Trinity here because it is the Spirit that gives life. When he says that, you, you can't have it unless the Holy Spirit opens your mind and your heart. And, and that can't happen unless you want your mind and your heart open. And, and therefore, sometimes where we need to start it by saying, Lord, Lord, I want to see. I want to see. Help me to see, Lord, because I, I, I just don't get it. Help me to see. But what we do know is Jesus is willing to allow many of his followers to walk away from him for the sake of the true doctrine that he was teaching, the doctrine on the Eucharist. He doesn't soften it. He makes it more difficult for them to believe. When, when we're dealing with the Eucharist and, and, and in a short while when, when the prayer of consecration is said, when the epiclesis where, where the Holy Spirit is called down upon the bread and upon the wine, the substance of the bread is transformed in, into the body of Christ and the substance of the, the blood is transformed, of the wine is transformed in the blood of Christ. We no longer have bread and wine on the altar. It is no longer bread and wine. It looks like bread. It smells like bread. It tastes like bread. But, but what we have is a substance that is fundamentally different from what we had before. What we have is Jesus Christ in his ascended body here in heaven. And, and if he could feed 5,000 with two loaves and fish in his earthly body, you want to tell me with his ascended body he can't feed the multitude every day that comes to the Eucharistic table? This is a miracle every time we do Eucharist. It is a miracle that we are celebrating. And to understand that is to understand, brothers and sisters, that just as they could not see the sign with the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and the few fish, 
Many times we are not seeing the sign that, that, that what happens here on this altar is the greatest miracle of all time. When Jesus says, you will do greater things than me, it is Eucharist that he's speaking about because this is greater. Because it makes him present. Physically, in, in the most real and tangible sense, it makes him present. And when we receive the Eucharist, brothers and sisters, we, we're not just receiving bread as a token, a sign, or symbol. We, we are receiving a fusion between our bodies and the body of God because God's body operates outside of time and the full sacrifice of the, of the, of the cross is contained in this body that we received in the Eucharist and the full sacrifice of, of Christ and everything he's done is given to us in this body that we receive and in this blood that we receive. And, and that full sacrifice lives in eternity and sees all times and seasons and all of that is brought into our bodies every time we receive the Eucharist. And because what we receive is the body of God himself, we ourselves are fused into the body of Christ, into God himself and into heaven. This is a doctrine of Jesus Christ. Let us pray that we come to believe. Amen.